Welcome to Future Talks. Today our guest is a prominent futurist from Netherlands, Luus Damhoff. She is a futures literacy expert and UNESCO chair of futures literacy in higher education at Hanze University of Applied Sciences in Netherlands. She is also a consultant of UNESCO and UNFCC which is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and a consultant of Oxfam. She has received uh, the award in 2016 of being the teacher of the year of all uh, of all higher education in the Netherlands. As future literacy expert, she has co-designed and developed training programs for projects like Work in Progress that helps to empower youth in Nigeria and Somaliland to create open narratives and new opportunities for their own future. Uh, she is an inspiring speaker and she has been involved in a multiple projects and we are very happy to welcome her today, today in our studio. Thank you so much uh, Luz Demhoff for taking your time out and uh, participating in future talks today. Okay, uh, I will begin with the, uh, your story. Uh, how did you get interested in future studies? What brought you here? Okay, thank you. It's um, I'd like to think it's a good story. <laughs> um, I was um, uh, I got really interested into futures uh, thinking, uh, like future literacy in specific. Um, uh, about five years ago. But before that, I've been working with futures and thinking about futures in education for a long time. Uh, I had been a senior lecturer in 21st century skills and uh, implemented those uh, learning paths uh, throughout the curriculum for my students at the university because we wanted um, to prepare students for jobs that didn't exist. Or as I would used to say, I prepared my students for a future that does not exist. But I was always wondering if I say I prepare my students for a future that doesn't exist. First of all, that's kind of a contradiction or terminus. How can you prepare for something that doesn't exist? And I thought to myself, no future exists, right? So what, what am I actually saying? And so I was curious that how do we prepare students? How do we relate or engage with something that is unknown, with uncertainty? And I was, I was searching for, for an answer to that. And, and at one time, it was at a conference where I stumbled upon a Riel Miller's work, Future Literacy in a workshop, and it was only like an hour and a half. Uh, the workshop was given by uh, Kasper Nozerzewski, also a futurist from Poland. And I, thought, I remember thinking, I think this is it. I think this is the skill that uh, I can use to, um, to help students to relate with uncertainty, maybe even embrace it. And so I was really intrigued um, and I was uh, looking for ways to how to implement it. And a couple of weeks later, I um, was fortunate enough to not only become the teacher of the year uh, in the Netherlands, but also receive a grant. And I was free to do, uh, to use it as I please. So I decided to use it on this. And uh, so I approached UNESCO because I knew it came from, uh, from UNESCO, but UNESCO was really, um, designing future literacy laboratories for policymakers and governments uh, all, all over the globe. So I approached uh, Riel Miller and I said, I have uh, some money and uh, I want to run a pilot for uh, students, master students who are in the middle of uh, um, programs that deal with transition and transformation, energy, uh, healthy aging, etc. Uh, so I think this is a very useful uh, competency. So he said, good, come over. So I flew to Paris and um, I spent five hours in his office uh, talking to Riel Miller. And I just remember this incredible feeling, this transformational learning moments. And uh, for those of those students who are watching, uh, sometimes you just feel that you're this feeling that you're stepping over a threshold and you're entering a new world and you don't really know what it is yet, but you know something has changed. This feeling of transformation, transformative learning that just stays with you. And I had that feeling when I was uh, at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Uh, I didn't quite understand what future literacy was yet, but I knew it was going to keep me occupied for many years to come. And it felt like I was entering unknown territory and very exciting, very exploratory. So I came back 
And um, I started, uh, I set up a team and I started to run the first pilot specifically for master students in an interdisciplinary environment where they learned the capability and not only uh, this kind of mindsets, but also how to design and facilitate these processes themselves. So that was a two week intensive. And after that, I was uh, just struck by the empowerment that students experience. Uh, the idea that they are not just helpless pawns and that the future is coming at them, but they can actually engage uh, with it. They can actually um, stretch their imagination. And that sense of empowerment, um, that just was uh, mind blowing. So I decided to uh, change my profession or uh, stay with the university, but spent all of my time on understanding this capability better and designing um, these learning spaces, these safe learning spaces for students to explore. And from one thing led to another, uh, we got a UNESCO chair. So now we're doing research on the impact of future literacy. We uh, did on design principles and we train, facilitate, um, teach to students, faculty, professionals, organizations, um, all over the globe. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and this is now, uh, this is what I do. And the thing is that when I started this journey, I said uh, to prepare my students for jobs that don't exist. Right now, I feel like I have a job that didn't exist five years ago. Um, so I guess I am living uh, my profession. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm very, uh, it's been a, it's been a journey, but uh, still keeping that exploratory mind. Uh, I'm happy that I'm not done playing yet in that uh, in this playground. So that's, yeah, that's a little bit how it started. And the uh, uh, future literacy is now considered a foundational competency. Uh, so why do we need this future literacy so much today as compared to earlier times? Mm. What is the, the need for future literacy now? Yeah. Um, I think we've always needed it, but we feel it's more needed now because we are living in a at times of perceived high um, uh, intense uh, uncertainty. Um, and of course, it has everything to do with, with, uh, with COVID and the situation that we're in. So uh, and people say it all the time as well, right? So we're, these are times of uncertainty, complex times. And it's because our assumptions about continuity and discontinuity are being challenged. The moment Corona uh, uh, broke out, this pandemic broke out over the world, uh, we were challenged on our assumptions about uh, mobility, uh, about our health, uh, about um, uh, uh, offices, buildings, uh, architecture, um, our identity, what it means to work from home, uh, etc. So we were constantly, we were really uh, uh, international collaboration. So all these assumptions that we have, the things that we just took for granted, are now being we were challenged about a year ago, and uh, and so it feels like that times are more uncertain, but times have always been uncertain. Times have always been complex, which is perceived them as more uncertain. So it also feels like, whoa, uh, since now we realize that the future cannot be predicted, it's unpredictable by nature, although predicted all the time, it is unpredictable by nature. Uh, so uh, we cannot just rely on the assumptions and predictions uh, that we had. Uh, so how? So then the question arises, how do, you, how do we relate to that? How do we change our mindset and attitude towards uncertainty. Because now we understand that we cannot eliminate all uncertainty. So do we have more uncertainties now? You said that uh, we always had uncertainties. That's yes, true. Always, but, yes. Uh, our, uh, these days we see uh, changes coming very fast. It is, uh, I mean, there is a very fast change that we are going through now. And now uh, we are more interconnected, more interdependent because of globalization which mm -hmm. we, we were not. And because of that, the systems have become much more complex because of the interaction between these entities, which were nation states who were interacting with their neighbors only. Now we interacting all around the globe. So mm -hmm. is, is it the complexity, uh, uh, the in increase in the complexity of systems because of their interconnection and interdependence? as well as the speed of change that has also led to the need for future literacy? I, I think uh, yes and, 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 and uh, yes and no. <laughs> I think it is becoming more clear 
that we need to um, uh, rethink our relationship with uncertainty and complexity, because I think it's becoming uh, increasingly clear that we cannot eliminate all uncertainty and we cannot solve all complexity. And future literacy, um, uh, I think it helps us not only to deal with it, but even go further to actually appreciate uncertainty and complexity and do not see as it's something that we need to, to solve. I agree that uh, it might feel that things uh, are changing faster, that, uh, but at the same time, a lot of things are staying the same as well. So sometimes the uh, assumption that things are changing faster or things become more complex or things become more uncertain can also paralyze us. Because then we think, oh, it's so complex, I can't understand it. Okay, well, if we cannot understand it, then why do we not appreciate it? Because complexity in itself is a feature of, of the universe, of life. Life is complex. Nature, we think that the use of technology has made our lives more complex. But anybody who looks, takes a closer look at nature, how complex nature functions, that has been there all along. I mean, the complexity of the universe, of life in itself, it's, it's un, we cannot grasp it. We, we only barely understand a fraction of it how life is conceived, how we, how the universe, there's so many things we don't know. So things have always been complex, but in our daily lives, that is more influenced by technology, we perceive it, it comes more, it comes closer to us. So we perceive it as more complex. And uh, instead of trying to solve that, why would we? Why not uh, uh, appreciate it, embrace it, but also maybe take advantage of it, that things are complex and that uncertainty also opens things up for more opportunities and possibilities. And I'd like to give an example uh, uh, in education. Uh, when COVID, uh, when this corona, when this pandemic uh, broke out, um, a lot of uh, universities and higher educational institutes, and mine was not is not an exception in that, um, they moved all the education online. Right, a lot of work took place online, so we just moved all the classes online, and we had to enter a really steep learning curve on how to teach online, how to uh, learn online. And, um, uh, and, and we, we did that pretty quickly and people were pretty proud to say that we did this really smoothly. Uh, so no student gets left behind and we can just continue the program. But at the same time, everything is different. So instead of following the same program, but then online, why not use this pandemic and use this situation as a learning moment in itself? What can we learn? What lessons are there in this complex situation that we're in? lessons about, uh, about our identity as students or teachers or professors. Our, uh, uh, we can uh, learn lessons about how we, how we learn, how we collaborate, about mobility, how we relate to, us, to each other, uh, about physicality, do we want to learn in different spaces. So I think that every time our, uh, something disruptive happens and we are challenged, then there's also an opportunity. So uncertainty, it's also uh, an opportunity to see different possibilities. But you can only really see that if you are willing to stretch the imagination and you're, if you're only willing to explore multiple futures. If you see the future as one identity that is sort of fixed, then uh, you won't see all these opportunities in uncertainty. And then uncertainty scares you. Right? Then it just becomes something that we need to solve so we can still uh, reach our destination. But if you see the future as a, a, a multi multitude of futures of possibilities, then, then uh, uncertainty can become a friend instead of a foe and something that um, can teach us. Uh, and I think future literacy is exactly that. It is the capability to imagine multiple futures, um, to understand the underlying assumptions and biases that we have, and by doing that, it opens up the imagination even more. And then we can see the present anew. So we see new opportunities in the present that we didn't see before because we were uh, focused on one future. So there's a lot of different elements to unpack in this uh, uh, complex capability. Uh, it's about imagination. It's about uh, um, a reflection on your assumptions, understanding how anticipation works. It's about creativity. It's about cognitive flexibility. Uh, it's about understanding the sources of our hopes and fears. Um, and ultimately, uh, for, for young people, for students, 
is to empower them to feel that um, I'm not just uh, uh, um, following in the steps of someone else's future, but I can actually engage with it. I can have an opinion. I can relate to it. I can have a conversation with multiple futures. And I do not just have to follow someone else's uh, um, future, someone else's scenario. So I think that's, that's a very important element. And it has become more essential. The United Nations has called it the essential capability of the 21st century because of the situation they were in of COVID, that we've come to understand that we cannot predict or plan our way out of everything. So we need to understand what are we taking for granted? What are we not seeing? How can we seize on opportunities and uncertainty and avoid making the same mistakes as we did in the past? So yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has always been essential, but now it feels more essential because the time is here. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next question uh, deals with the unpredictability of the future. Uh, earlier, we believed that uh, a future can be uh, predicted and the fourth uh, foresight institutes that we had in different uh, multinational companies and in government departments uh, were, were, were trying to forecast future, make a uh, planning based on that. So how, uh, why don't, can't we predict the future now when we thought earlier that we can? Uh, what changed? Um, I think we can't, we can't still, uh, I mean, we still predict the future and that is very, uh, that's very helpful. Um, what, um, uh, but so future literacy, we're not saying that you shouldn't do that or uh, that's not wise. I mean, for example, uh, let's say I predict that tomorrow the sun will come up. Yeah, it's a fairly safe prediction. I mean, it's based on a scientific fact, and I, uh, I make the assumption that that is true. <laughs> I also make that assumption because so far as I've, I've been alive, the sun has always come up. So far as I know, the sun always comes up every morning. So I make a prediction that tomorrow morning, the sun will come up again. There's not, that, that, I'm not challenging that assumption at all. It's still a prediction and it's still an assumption, but I think it's a pretty safe bet. Also, when I look at my uh, weather app on my phone, I predict that in a couple of hours, it's going to rain, although the sky is still blue, but I trust my phone, I trust the technology, I make an assumption about science, so I make a prediction. These things are all very, val very valid, uh, and these we can count on, and that helps us to uh, make plans, to prepare for something, to make decisions. That's all very true. However, there are different kinds of predictions that maybe are less set in stone. So for example, if I make uh, the prediction, if I say that uh, technology will uh, save us from climate change or technology will save us from the impact of climate change. So we will uh, find a solution, a technical solution that will deal with the effects. That's a pretty, that's a prediction assumption, maybe a trend or development that you predict but it has a huge impact on how we behave today. Yeah? The same as if I say uh, it's going to rain in two hours, so I'll take an umbrella that also has an impact on how I behave today because I'm bringing an umbrella. But that's a very short term, pretty innocent way of impacting the present, right? I mean, take an umbrella. If I don't, I get wet. Nobody you know, is gonna know that it's not gonna, it's not a big deal. However, if we, make our plans on a national or international level based on the assumption that technology will come up with a solution for climate change, that has, that has, dip, has an impact on a different scale. There's an impact of a different nature uh, because we are not only um, uh, maybe postponing our responsibility to, to later, that means that we are not, maybe not, we're making different decisions uh, about climate change and uh, our behavior in the present, so, and these two, but this is the key about future literacy. Can you identify, can you navigate, can you see the differences in these kind of predictions? Uh, it's going to rain in two hours or technology will save us from climate change. So, and, and I think that is the key. So forecasting and foresight can be extremely useful for planning, preparation, um, making certain decisions. But if we talk about strategy or long-term plans or beliefs, or if we do not understand the assumptions that we are making about a prediction like technology and climate change, then we are in a way colonizing the future. 
because that has a huge impact on our decision making. And are we sure? Are we sure that that's, uh, that that is the wisest decision? So future literacy helps you understand the blind spot, to see the blind spots, and to see different uh, opportunities in the present. Not because you'll make the best decisions, but you'll, at least you'll make better informed decisions if you understand those. So uh, it's about understanding that how we uh, use the future, how we anticipate, uh, has an impact on our behavior in the present. And it's, it's about becoming aware what different assumptions we are making in what context and for what different purposes. So we constantly predict the future, we dream, we fear, we use her, we make assumptions, we do that anyway. Future literacy helps you to become aware of the, of the why we do it and how we do it. So we can make better informed decisions and we can seize on different opportunities and we see different uh, things emerge in the present. So it's really about enhancing our perception. Uh, so it's not foresight or forecasting, uh, scenario planning. Uh, those are all parts of a big tent of future studies. And future literacy brings in this idea of being open for emergence, embracing uncertainty. So it's just another addition to a big tent of uh, future studies. And I'm sure there will be a lot more knowledge to come because we need funda more fundamental research on how and why we anticipate how that works. So we're not done yet uh, filling up the tent and it's not, nothing is wrong. Uh, there's, this is not a replacement, just an addition. And it just brings a different perspective uh, to the table. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, in fact, like Min, uh, if I uh, can put it this way, that uh, when we talk about prediction, uh, we can uh, safely predict about the objective world. Uh, when we are talking about the social structures, uh, we cannot predict it as safely as we could the objective world. Is that mm. uh, the point? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and maybe and neither we should, because if, if uh, the, the question is also who has uh, uh, the ability to predict, who has the power to predict, uh, who is in charge of making these predictions, of making these decisions, right? And whose future are we talking about? Um, so future literacy is also about democratizing uh, futures. To uh, it's about uh, for for citizens uh, to to actively engage in uh, is this really a future that we want, right? Or are we um, uh, if we're talking are we are the big tech companies telling us where it's going to go and whose future are we really talking about? So it's yeah. really about opening up the dialogue to share these different perspectives. Uh, another. Um, uh problem that we face when we are talking about uh, uh, futures and we were talking about the uh, uh, the freedom of will with the students, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the beliefs or assumptions are that there is a destiny and uh, we cannot change it. And mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you counter that? How, how do you uh, persuade these people who have this idea of destiny, a uh, mm -hmm. future which is written down and they cannot change it? Uh, how, how do you change their perspective? Um, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I'm always very careful about persuading or changing somebody's mind. Uh, I think future literacy is the capability that helps you understand that if you, if you assume there's a destiny, that that is an assumption. So it's not about saying, oh, your idea of destiny is wrong. It's just saying that be aware that the future does not exist. It only exists in your, our imagination. So when you think, if you have a destiny in your mind that helps you to get through the day, that gives you strength, that's fine. But understand that the future does not exist. It's an assumption and it only exists in your imagination. So, um, and there are multiple other futures as well. So it's more about awareness than changing somebody's mind with every capability. Every capability is an empower, can in itself is an empowering tool. But I don't know if, if I would be very careful saying that, oh, this is wrong. There's no judgment. It's just about becoming aware that when you anticipate on that destiny, it, 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 it's an, it is an anticipation. And if you choose, I believe, because it can also be a very personal belief, I believe that there's a destined future. Okay, but just be aware that that's a belief based on background, culture, uh, et cetera, conviction. So 
uh, I, I would um, uh, I would be very careful saying um, uh, to, to change people's minds if that's what they want to to think. But or and <laughs> I think if we if students young people are making decisions because they are afraid of the future, because somehow the future gives them a sense of anxiety. Um, uh, they think that, oh, uh, there's nothing I can do. So I, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just what it is. I'm just gonna deal with it. Then I think that comes not from a place of abundance, but it comes from a place of, of um, uh, uh, how do you say that, that uh, of, of a limitation. So if you feel that I'm making these assumptions about the future and I feel this is what I choose to believe, that's great. But if you think there's nothing else, this is what's going to happen, that I think we can work with. Because I think for young people to understand that uh, you do not need to get paralyzed by complexity of uncertainty. There's not just one future, there are multiple. And you can have you can relate to that, and that sense is very important. So I'm always for not to change somebody's mind or to persuade, but I think it's like reading. And Real Miller often compares it to reading and writing. It's like showing students there's an alphabet. You can make words, and uh, what are you going to do with it? It's up to you. But, but this is the capability, and it allows you to feel empowered to use it to make other decisions to. Uh, to gain knowledge, to learn, to communicate, to see things differently. These are all very empowering tools and that is important. But whether you choose to believe something is still in destiny, that comes after, that's up to you. Makes sense. And uh, uh, what is the role of imagination in uh, future literacy? You already uh, mentioned that, but if you uh, uh, give us some more idea, like uh, how do we use imagination as a tool to envision future mm. uh, and why do why are we using it now um uh, uh, first of all uh, um, uh, we always say that that we're very we're not very good at it <laughs> imagining uh because it's really difficult to to imagine something that's not there to imagine something that doesn't exist and when we imagine we always do that based on uh, things that we know uh, maybe we make new connections and, and et cetera, and we build on something, but, uh, you know, so because we're not very good at it and we, we don't really learn it at school that much. So we're, and plus we get fed by a lot of stories around us. Right. Um, so if we see the world as it is, and, um, where we're, we're only using futures to plan and prepare, uh, then that parts that imaginative power becomes, gets a little bit subdued. So, Plus we get, our imagination gets fed by, by stories, by, by, holly, by movies, by books, by uh, narratives and the media. They tell us this is what the future will look like by billboards, uh, all city, future cities look, like, look the same with high rise and flying cars. And, you know, so that's, those are the images that we uh, perceive and we think, oh, okay, that's our future. That's great, that can inspire us, that's fine. But we also need to, uh, uh, learn better to imagine more, need to stretch that imagination. And we do this in, in future literacy by uh, asking people their images, uh, their probable futures, what they think is going to happen. And then they often come with images like flying cars and high rise and technology, etc., which is often inspired by images around us. And then we ask, what, what, what desirable future do you see? So what, what would you like? And then we always get images of people working together, closer to nature, in harmony, uh, you know, peaceful, beautiful, uh, etc. So, and these are also uh, fed by beautiful stories around us. And uh, so we collect all these images and we think, okay, so now we know where people are at. We have an understanding what their visions are on the top of their mind. And then we try to unpack them a little bit. So what does that really look like closer to nature? What does that mean? Uh, do, you, do we live in trees or do we, yeah. And uh, so then, then people start to think about, okay, so if I would, this, this vague notion of living in harmony with nature, if I would have to fit it into my world, then it always starts to, to stretch a little bit. And then we use a very powerful tool, it's called the reframing tool. And the reframing tool is presenting uh, students and participants with a, an alternative scenario, an alternative future that uh, is not probable, not desirable, something very different. 
And that uh, helps uh, them to challenge their assumptions. So it can be a little bit bizarre, maybe. Uh, uh, and then uh, we ask them to, to how to relate to it. How do, how do they feel about it? And to unpack that scenario as well. So what would that look like, uh, this world? Uh, what would you see in the streets? How would people relate or communicate? Or what is the world, uh, nature, animals, what do they do? And that really helps in stretching that imagination. But I have to say that um, we often use language in expressing our imaginations, and that is not enough. Language is an incredibly powerful tool. It helps us to communicate, although, you know, English is not my first language, but I speak it so we can communicate. It's very powerful. And at the same time, it's also very uh, formative. So it, it, it also restricts us because uh, we have images in a, maybe we feel it in our, our bellies or we, we uh, we see it sometimes, or uh, imagination pop up through scent or audio. So we also need art and different ways of uh, uh, imagining, not just not just verbal or language or written word, uh, but we need all the sensory sensory approaches to uh, start imagining. So we always work with exploring multiple futures, probable ones, plausible, desirable, alternative ones. And that really stretches the imagination. And then you see, once you've uh, seen uh, all these different futures, you'll notice different things in the present, just because your mind, your, your vision has opened up a little. So you notice different things. If I imagine a world that, that I collaborate with animals, for example, I don't know, then I will notice different things, how my dog responds to things. Or if I imagine a world with no campuses, just free learning and everybody learns all the time, I'll notice different things within my students when I see them in the classroom. So, and that is what it's really about. Um, um, imagining multiple futures. So we'll notice different things in the present. We'll see different things. And we need that enhanced perception to uh, make better informed decisions. Okay, uh, and uh, you have a uh, UNESCO chair, uh, you are uh, have the UNESCO chair future literacy in higher education. Um, how uh, do you, uh, how did you get this chair? What is the process procedure of getting it? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, how does it uh, benefit the society? Hmm. Um, UNESCO chair, it's, it's a pretty straightforward process in the sense that you need to be uh, affiliated or uh, work at an uh, educational uh, institute. It's a research chair, so that means you need to uh, uh, write a proposal with a research agenda for uh, roughly four years. Um, it, you need to collaborate with your uh, national committee of UNESCO, so every country has a national committee that is kind of the gateway or the intermediate between uh, UNESCO and, uh, and the, the, the national government. And uh, uh, so it's always about a certain specific uh, topic or field uh, that you do research in. And uh, when the chair, you get it for four years, uh, when, it is, uh, when it's given to you, when it's uh, approved, uh, you get it for four years. And it's not, you, you get a, um, access to an incredibly extensive network. Of, of chairs all over the world, there are hundreds of uh, UNESCO chairs. And right now they're, we're in the process of getting about 20 on futures literacy and foresight. And you need to have a, uh, a few, uh, several international partners uh, to ensure the flow of knowledge between the global North and the global South. And that is very important, right? How do you, how do you make sure that what you do not just stays, not just benefits your educational institute, but actually uh, benefit society, but even more the international, the global uh, community as well. That is incredibly important. And to keep uh, what we do within our uh, chair, if it just benefits uh, the population of my university, that's not what UNESCO stands for. So it's really about uh, ensuring that flow of knowledge and vice versa, gaining knowledge from, we have a, a, a partner in uh, Uruguay, we have a partner in Nigeria, uh, Poland, uh, so we have uh, Chile, so we have several partners that we collaborate with uh, in terms of uh, research grants, uh, projects, uh, sometimes organizing workshops or sessions, and that is very important that it's always uh, does the global community benefit 
from the knowledge creation at your local uh, university. And, uh, and it's an incredible uh, honor to be part of the network. It's a very strong network of UNESCO. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're very happy and we're looking forward to uh, applying for the next one in about two years, so yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, and uh, um, about your future literacy lab of uh, UNESCO, uh, how does that benefit uh, societies as uh, also uh, when you have conducted labs in, uh, uh, in Netherlands and then you have come conducted some labs in, uh, let's say, in Nigeria, uh, mm -hmm. which is a developing country like Pakistan, did you see any kind of differences in their assumptions of future as compared mm -hmm. to people or citizens of ne Netherlands? Yeah, of course, people are different everywhere. So absolutely. Um, uh, the couple of uh, observations that I have, and I'm always very careful of painting a, a, a wide brush uh, uh, or generalizing populations or culture. Um, I've been very, we've been very fortunate to uh, work together with Oxfam in Somalia and Nigeria as part of the Work in Progress uh, um, project, which is really about uh, empowering young people. I mean, Africa is the fastest growing youngest continent. And in a few years, a lot of young people enter the job market. And what are the jobs? Uh, it's, it's about entrepreneurship, starting new industry. So thinking about the future is very important in that sense and empowering them uh, to, to, uh, to think about their own future is very important. So do I see differences? Of course. Uh, and at the same time, sometimes it's shocking how, uh, how they are, uh, how the younger generation, how sometimes the differences between young people in either Vietnam, because I've done laps in, in Asia as well, in Vietnam or China, Nigeria, Somaliland and the Netherlands, the, because everybody is more connected on the internet, I feel that there's a, sometimes a similar sense of, of the future then, for example, within the country, I see sometimes more of a cultural divide between the younger generation and the older generation in a certain country. So, so that's that's also an observation. Um, but um, uh, the things that I've noticed, because um, we at, 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 at my university, we design these learning spaces and we, did, we come up with these design principles on how to um, teach and implement future literacy. And of course, it needs to be heavily contextualized uh, according to the culture of what you do this in. Um, and that's why every time we do a lab, we collaborate closely with the people, the local champions, as we call them, on the ground. Because otherwise you just can't do that. Because it is a, a potentially transformative uh, way of thinking. It needs to be in co-creation, in collaboration, um, customized uh, uh, with people in the local context. It, otherwise, it just doesn't work. Um, so in Nigeria, uh, uh, yes, in Nigeria, we train uh, uh, trainers uh, at um, educational institutes and training institutes who train young people in the so-called 21st century skills. So we train the trainers. And we've always also done a lab with, with the youth and uh, uh, yeah, um, I think a lot of the differences are in the heuristics. So uh, it's, 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 it's a lot more uh, artistic expression, uh, song and dance, uh, body work. Uh, um, in the Netherlands, uh, we focus a lot more in the individual reflection. Students reflect on their own thinking on their own development all the time. Uh, and there in, 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 in Nigeria and Somaliland, it's more about the collective narrative. So what assumption do we have as a country? It's a lot more about the future of Somaliland, uh, for example, than it is about your personal uh, future because that is so, the personal journeys are so aligned with the future of, of that nation state. So, um, I, and some of these narratives go a, a, lot, a lot deeper. Uh, the narrative of the African relationship uh, Africa's relationship with the West, um, about uh, the narratives, the, the, the broader collective narratives of, of an area or a city or like Lagos or a country are sometimes so deeply rooted that, uh, and go a lot more, go a lot deeper than, um, uh, than what, for example, Dutch students are um, uh, thinking about in their career choices. So it's just also a different focus, I would say. But, and then, so that the differences are, yeah, mostly uh, um, we change the heuristics, we change uh, the language, uh, often it's expressed by proverbs, 
uh, and we, but it's very important that you always do that in co-creation and collaboration, because otherwise you can't just develop one learning space, uh, how to do things and just copy and paste it in a completely different context. That just uh, that doesn't make anybody happy. And I think it's, um, uh, I also sense a difference um, that uh, in the Netherlands, it, it's um, because of that individual, because it's a more individualistic country, I would say it's more about how for each person, what are your individual assumptions? And the work that we do for Oxfam, Somalia, and Nigeria is also about how, how can we make a difference? How can we make a change? There's a lot more hunger for for uh, for for hope, uh, for uh, for decolonizing futures, really deconstructing the certain narratives, um, uh, and that is a difference in the Netherlands. There, it's more about how can I uh, work on a sustainable or energy transition in my master program. So, I think that's that that idea of decolonizing futures is a very important uh, important element. Um, and to quote uh, a Nigerian proverb, um, unless um, we teach the line how to speak, and uh, the hunting story will always glorify the hunter. And in a lot of uh, narrative stories, it is about the hunting story, and we tend to teach the lion the capability of mankind. But I think that future literacy in a lot of developing countries is about deconstructing the story altogether. What is the, the, the existing narrative um, there that we can somehow uh, break down and build up uh, uh, and empower and feel, feel strongly about? So it's not just about teaching the capability in, in um, the countries that I work in. It's also about coming up with new um, open narratives that, um, yeah, make sure that, they are, uh, that the future is not just decided by a few, but it's meant to be for all. That, that is true, and this is the same kind of um, a, a challenge that we face when we are interacting with our students in Pakistan, uh, mm. because they think that uh, they do not have that kind of abundance, they do not have that kind of uh, uh, space where they can maneuver their future. In fact, they believe that most of the things are going to be done to them instead of they doing something. Mm. Uh, for instance, uh, there is an assumption that uh, all the technological trends uh, come from uh, come to us from the developed Western countries, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to live with it. So instead of trying to create the, those trends, which we cannot, so we'll have to adjust with it. And one yeah. challenge that uh, that that we face is that when we are we are trying to use prediction or forecasting model uh, to to predict the emerging trends, technological trends mm -hmm. that is coming from other countries to our countries, mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to figure out how long it takes for, for our technological development, our developmental mm -hmm. trend to come to a developing country like Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Because if we have that, uh, we can plan our strategies be better. We can plan our mm -hmm. active uh, actions better. Yeah. Uh, so uh, any ideas, uh, uh, any uh, literature that you have gone through that can give us a clue of how long it takes for a trend to move from the Western developed countries to the developing countries? Mm. Um, I would say, I would, uh, I, would, I would probably approach it differently. And I think this is the exact same example what I was talking about, uh, about uh, deconstructing an existing narrative and building a new one. Because the idea that somehow you, Pakistan has to wait for the West to develop a certain, that narrative I think is so, um, uh, it, it, that has such a large impact on how we act and behave in the present. And I think it's, it's almost, that those are the, the almost colonial, colonized futures that I'm talking about. So how can we change that narrative that it's not about this, this dependence, but that somehow we are more developed and we know better technologies because we're in a different uh, pace of linearity and time. But what can we learn from the resilience or the mindset or the innovative power? Now, I've never been to Pakistan and I hope I, can, I will be there one day. But what I see in Nigeria, for example, is a huge abundance in innovative power and creativity and, and resilience and, 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 and humor and, and 
So what can we learn, um, uh, we from the West, uh, uh, what, what is happening at the, the um, uh, so I, I would like to really start from, from the beginning that just waiting for certain trends to arrive is one, is one narrative, is one story. But what if it will be the other way around? So we always ask these kind of questions. What if it will be the other way around? Like the Wakanda scenario from Black Panther, the movie. What if it would just be vice versa? How would, how would that feel? And if you, if you think, well, that's never going to happen, then we need to work on that. Because it might just just because technology is moving very quickly in in certain parts of the world that also brings a lot of problems around ethics maybe a lack of empathy uh, yes technology connects us but at the same time you know it's it's not uh, it's not all all, all good <laughs> so it's it's also to ask these critical questions what it, is it actually the future that we want and what can we do to, to change a story and to be seen as, as equal partners? Just, uh, and that's the, the deconstruction of those narratives that I, those are fundamental and not easy. And, uh, and sometimes not always, um, uh, you know, it takes time. But um, uh, I, I, I always, um, I don't believe in, uh, I believe in watching for trends and developments, uh, but I don't think, um, uh, I think if we look at those trends and developments, it tells us a lot of where we are today as a global community. About, it tells us a lot about geopolitical relationships. It tells us about power. It tells us uh, about the state of the world. And I think that if we really want to uh, let everybody participate uh, in the conversation about futures. I think we need to look critically at those relationships instead of uh, just following the trends. Because if you see a trend that's great and extremely useful, at the same time, what assumptions are lying underneath when you, when you see that trend? What is it if you extrapolate that to the future? What are you assuming to continue? Is it something that you want? A whose future is it? Who benefits? Who remains to have the power? And is that something that we, that conversation that we want to continue? And that I think is, uh, need, starts, uh, needs to happen uh, first before we take over certain trends and developments because trends and developments are predictions, extra, extrapolations of the knowledge we have in the present. That's it, it only the future is the later than now, it doesn't exist, no one has ever been there. So um, there's still uh, a lot of things that happen. It can happen right now, but that's something that uh, the conversation needs to happen first. So I'm not uh, in the I business. Uh, the yeah. uh, deconstructing the, the existing narrative, then it is very difficult because uh, future has not yeah. happened. Nobody knows, but the past has, and everybody has felt it. So uh, the, the, this uh, disempowerment, this, uh, which is caused by operation uh, mm -hmm. that we feel in the developing countries, uh, that that creates that kind of narration. Absolutely. And when I go in an underprivileged community in Pakistan who are living in tents, they don't have three meals a day. And no. I talk about empowering them. It, uh, it is very difficult to, to, yeah. uh, um, uh, to deconstruct their stories that uh, their future is not going to be uh, the same yeah. that they have, yeah. ha they, that they, they, the, the kind of past that they had. So it is, it is a very challenging job and you're absolutely right. This is uh, the biggest stumbling block that we come across. Yes, and can I uh, quickly respond to that? Uh, I, I, I agree. I think uh, for, for a lot of people, and I speak from a tremendous position of privilege. I mean, I, 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 I hope I'm aware enough of, uh, that I can say that. Um, uh, for for uh, some communities who literally see no other future because it's just really difficult. I mean, to say that, oh, you just need to imagine another one. That's just, kind of, that's in itself, it's just uh, a notion that's, um, um, you know, that, that's, that, that I know that sounds very, very, uh, almost I'm simplifying that, that idea and I don't want to do that at all. But I think the conversation can happen on all different levels. So yes, on, on a, a level of power and where governance and where decision and policy makers are, but everybody to use it, use it the future, even in, in, in impoverished uh, communities or uh, in refugee camps, or we all anticipate whether it's for the next moment, the next hour, the next day. We just are not always aware of how we do that. And 
Um, so I, I refuse to think that uh, future literacy is just something from an ivory tower that is thought about academics and which is, you know, uh, I think it is a capability that has an empowering, like learning how to read and write. Yeah, it's not, uh, everybody can at least learn, has the capability to acquire that kind of capability. Uh, that has the capacity to acquire that capability. So I think that that's the next challenge for future literacy to literally bring it to the streets. How does, can this capability actually improve people's uh, lives? Uh, how they think, uh, their attitude, and that can happen on many different levels. And there needs to be a lot more knowledge and research on how to do that and also experimentation. Um, I've, I've worked uh, together with UNESCO. I was fortunate enough to consult a research group for Syrian families who were living in Lebanon. And it was, uh, they did a lab on the future of the return to Syria. I was not involved in that, but I helped them afterwards when they wanted to use future literacy within the families to rethink the family structures when they would return to Syria. So because the children have had different experiences, they, the war had, ch had changed their, their dynamics and they both parents and children had made assumptions about the family structure. So sometimes it can be very intimate and very small. And it's not always about deconstructing grand narratives about pol geopolitical structures, but sometimes it can be that uh, a, a small and intimate, but incredibly impactful about reframing and rethink uh, uh, just within the small circle of where you are in that community. How, who makes the decisions within the community? Uh, how do people relate to each other? So on every level uh, and with every group of people, uh, this is a capability that I believe uh, can be taught and can be practiced because we are just facilitating the process. Future literacy in every lab that I've been in, it's always what the collective, the collective wisdom of the group decides what is the outcome, what can it take and what does it need? And we are just facilitating uh, the process. So, uh, and I believe that is possible in every corner of the world. Uh, I, uh, I wish that uh, we can, we can uh, achieve the dream of futurists to, to empower everybody all around the world. And uh, it, it is uh, very difficult though, uh, especially in the kind of situation and condition mm -hmm. that people are living. And uh, long-term uh, uh, planning, long-term thinking is one of uh, the problems in uh, developing countries. But when I look at our, our societies, as you said, each individual does anticipate the future and uh, they think in terms of uh, making estimates, uh, guessing mm -hmm. about their future, they do all that. And uh, even the, uh, the people who are living on daily wages, they try to create a better future for their children, trying to send yeah. them to schools, expensive schools in the hope of a better future. Uh, the long-term thinking is there in the uh, general population in Pakistan, for instance, but it is not there in, uh, on the institutional level. It mm -hmm. is the institutions, the government, and the other uh, uh, organization who lack future thinking, a long-term planning. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how do we uh, work with those, uh, those organizations, which, we, which are running on ad hocism, all the decisions are made for just now and not thinking mm -hmm. about the future. And uh, they have a kind of indifference towards environment because they are more in uh, thinking uh, um, selfishly for the present only mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. considering the future and the future generation. How do we work with those organizations and institutions mm -hmm. in a developing country like Pakistan? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question. And that's uh, for an institution to change it, it's, its way of working. Uh, I work in a large institution and uh, I'm the other way around. I wish we would be more, a little more ad hoc <laughs> and uh, 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 anticipate on emergence instead of um, uh, the future. Um, I, one word that, that struck with me in your your if we institute is the word empathy, and um, uh, and I think empathy can be a strategy, too, to and I think that if you want to work with these organizations, it's very important again to co-create and collaborate and understand the context of where they're working in. Sometimes, if you want to, um, uh, and I think that as as futurists, we need. Uh, I think empathy, but also modesty is key. 
I don't think we should come in and say, oh, this is, this is it. This is the new way. This is going to be, that will not change or inspire anybody. That's just confronting and can be threatening. And because uh, that means you'll have to maybe change the way you do things. And why would that be good? So, um, so I always come to understand that if you want to innovate and, and work and, and introduce a new, a new capability, it starts with invitation, uh, not pushing for innovation per se, but just really inviting people uh, uh, to the table and start exploring together. So it's really about understanding the context of where and why people work ad hoc. What is behind their, their reasoning? And can we look at those things? And is that actually uh, the most, uh, uh, actually the best way? And just challenge that, but you need to do that together. Coming in and saying, this is going to be the future and you're so far behind, you need to change. That is not, then, then that's just not really lasting sustainable change. And that's also not the, the way of, that's also not, the, that's not about democratizing futures either. Right, we have to do this together. So, uh, I really believe uh, uh, if you're approaching this, that start the conversation and how people see uh, futures and understanding where their source source of hopes and fears come from. Because if you only work on an ad hoc basis and you've been doing this for years and you're just assuming that this is the best way, there might be a source of fear underneath that or an idea about fear of losing power, of losing certain ways. So let's look at that. And the key, the most beautiful part, and one of the most beautiful parts about a future literacy exercise or lab that we do is that we always take it to the far future, 2070, 2100. Not because we know what's going to happen, but because that release people of the pressure of being an expert. So they can leave the expertise behind. Because uh, if you talk about the future in five years, people think, oh, but I know, I know because I've been doing it and I know what's going to look like. But if you say, let's talk about 50 years from now, nobody knows. And, and the, 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 the perception, the perspective of a student in 50 years is just as valuable as, as an expert who been, who's been doing this work for years. So you're just taking this mental leap to the far future. So to create this even playing field that you can actually discuss and debate, why are we doing the things that we're doing? why what is underlying the our, our future visions and that can be that can be a very fruitful way to start the dialogue but again it's also about modesty which is facilitating a capability we're not here to colonize another future by this kind of thinking so i think that's that comes uh, um that comes with the job okay uh, and uh, you have all already uh, talked about how futurists are working together are helping out each other. We are a, a, a new nascent uh, Institute of Future Studies, the only uh, institute at a Pakistani university. Uh, what are your uh, suggestions, recommendations? How do we connect and collaborate with futurists mm. like you? Mm. Well, uh, I hear an invitation. <laughs> so I would happy uh, uh, to start that conversation and see uh, just compare our, our practices, what you do. I'm, I'm, I think it's wonderful to have this institute uh, with so much potential uh, at a university. I mean, it's really, you have the, the, so much potential outreach to students, which is incredible. Yes, we have a UNESCO chair. We are practicing on the ground, really applied sciences. So we have a lot of data and experience with designing these learning spaces. So let's see and where, where we can complement each other. Uh, can we share our practices for the students to actually, you know, do it with training teachers? Uh, and what, what we can learn from you is that the foresight approach, the, the research that you do, the outreach that you have. So I think that would be a great way to complement each other. And so that starting by sharing uh, our knowledge and uh, I'm always very much in favor of um, uh, just uh, trying something out. So start a, a, a tryout, a pilot, uh, uh, doing uh, maybe um, uh, mix, uh, pairing up with faculty or, uh, you know, uh, compare our research uh, results and just maybe uh, try to work together on uh, organizing a class or a workshop or a lab together, just kind of see how it goes. And I think that there's a lot to learn uh, from your institute and I'm very excited uh, 
uh, to start the collaboration. So I, uh, if it's an invitation, I think it is, that I uh, uh, accept it. And I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing where we can take this even further, especially because if we start working together and sharing, then I think uh, it's just better for, uh, for everybody. Absolutely. And uh, this is going to be my last question. <clears throat> Uh, you have, uh, you are building uh, uh, a new academy, the Emergence Academy, new school for new activism. Uh, what is the purpose and uh, what is behind it? Uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a, a, a plan, a dream that I have. Uh, got a little bit disrupted by COVID and Corona. But the idea behind it is that now I'm, I'm running these, these short-term trainings uh, programs at my university with my team. And we do it's a week or two weeks or a day here and there, et cetera. And what I noticed that well, like with every capability, it takes time to acquire this and to really fully implement it. Future literacy is such an empowerful, empowerful um, empowering capability. And the labs that we do are like incredibly powerful learning spaces. But afterwards, people go back to their daily routine and they, they, it, it requires a lot of work to, to keep up, like learning how to read, right? It just takes practice and learn how to play the piano, et cetera. So what I've come to see is that uh, having these short-term trainings are a great way to in get introduced into it, but then um, I think it's not enough. So I'm looking to start an academy where we can really fully um, uh, for young new activists, I say for, for uh, activists with a new sense of agency. And that is not always about doing, but also being about not doing, about being alert to be open for emergence. And to uh, throughout the course of a year, really implement this uh, uh, throughout the year into their own communities and just be mentored and tutored and get classes, etc. So really uh, bring to practice, bring to life this, uh, this idea that, yes, I use the future to plan and prepare and we need it, but I'm also using the future for emergence. So I'm hoping for whatever is coming at me in the present. And that's kind of almost systemic or uh, gradually um, implementing that in local communities, bringing it to the streets is really necessary because right now it's just these moment in times, but it needs care. It just takes time. Learning takes time. Transformational learning needs to be nurtured. It's not always about a quick fix. Sometimes we need to slow down and really learn how to do this well. Also in times of urgency, maybe especially in times of urgency. Are there any goals uh, uh, for this institute, uh, this new academy? Like you said, the future literacy tries to um, uh, use participatory approach, democratize mm -hmm. society. Yes. yes. All yeah, the yeah, stakeholders yeah. to making uh, decisions. So, and um, uh, we have sustainable development goals by mm -hmm. United Nations. Do you connect those with this academy? Oh, absolutely. I think it's. Uh, uh, but I'm. I'm very interested. Um, because uh, I think future literacy is a capability. It's, there are a lot. Of, there are several key competencies for the sustainable development goals, and I think uh, anticipatory competency is, is one of them that, that links so closely to it. But uh, what I also would like to see is that uh, a young people who are still very much rooted in their local community and start uh, uh, projects that are using future literacy within the local communities. And I'm working. Uh, together with an incredible network of futures-oriented museums all over the world. And uh, hopefully that's, that's the dream that somehow uh, we can also start showcasing the students' work uh, in these places, like these public places where people are invited to start that dialogue. Not to tell them this is what the future will look like, but to actually uh, engage in the conversation. What it is that we think, what is it that we want, uh, and what if it will be all different. And I think that, uh, and we need a more, a longer learning journey, a longer way, a longer time uh, to do this, to really practice this. Uh, for new uh, leaders, uh, young at heart, they don't have to be young per se, but young at heart and uh, inquisitive and exploratory minds uh, uh, to, to rise up uh, and start this participatory uh, approach. So yeah that's the idea thank you Luz, for taking your time out and sharing your learning and expertise with us today and thank you everyone for watching us today on future stocks we will bring you another interesting guest in our next episode of future stocks please 
take care of yourself and stay well.